Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name's Rowanna, I'm a psychologist from Sydney, Australia. Today I'm going to be answering a lot of frequently asked questions that people have typed in the comments below my videos. As you can see from the background, I am moving soon, which is why there are so many boxes, so please excuse that. Otherwise, let's hop right in. One question I got a lot and thanks uh, Apana who first mentioned this is what was my personal journey and how did I become a psychologist? I talked a little bit about this in my last video about psychology pathways and what to do in Australia if you want to become a psychologist. However, I didn't really talk about what I did personally. Um, I'm also going to try and include like what marks and stuff I got because I know people are interested in that. So I went straight from high school into uni and I enrolled at University of New South Wales in a Bachelor of Psychology. And I think the entry, the ATAR cutoff at that point was 96, like a 96 ATAR um, or HSC mark. So with the Bachelor of Psychology, you have honours included in it. So you do three years of just normal undergrad psychology, and then I was automatically in the honours. In order to qualify to do an honours, you need to get a mark or a wham of 75 or above, and I think I was somewhere in the 80s. So after honours, um, I got a, a 92 wham or weighted average mark, and I got into the University of Sydney straight away into their Masters of Clinical Psychology program. Because some of the more competitive unis have really limited spaces, they do make the entry requirements quite high. So at UNSW, I think there were 15 people in the cohort in my year. At UCID, there were 20. However, marks aren't everything. So if you have some kind of clinical experience or you had some research experience under your belt, that's really helpful. Personally, I had uh, ABA therapy, which is Applied Behavioral Analysis which is with kids with autism, I had done an after hours mental health helpline, kind of like lifeline, and I'd also done a heap of volunteering um, with the uni to do with student life. So it's really lovely having those types of experiences because they will ask you in the application as well. If you are interested in getting into masters, I'm not sure how many of you actually want to do that, feel free to let me know. Um, it is a bit of a hidden process because when you go to the interviews, they strictly tell you you can't tell anyone the questions and each uni also has a bit of a different criteria. And so every year, someone who might have made it last year who you think has a really good chance might not make it. So um, everyone in our cohort kind of had little guesses as to what might have contributed, but I don't think anyone actually knows what gets people into the master's program. I completed my two years of clinical master's and once I graduated from UCID, that was last year, I am now working as a psychologist. So during this time, I'm fully registered as a general psychologist. I can work, but I'm doing my registrar program. So that basically means that I just need to get a little bit more CPD or training on the side, as well as supervision. And after my two years of my registrar program, I will officially get my clinical title and can be called a clinical psychologist. So that's kind of my journey wrapped up. Another question that I get a lot is about earning potential and salary. So this one's quite tricky because it really depends what area of psychology you want to get into. It also depends whether you become a generalist or a clinical psychologist. I'll leave a screenshot here on top of my face um, to show you the common rates as well. This basically is what New South Wales Health psychologists get paid and so if you're hired within the hospital system you get these rates based on how many years of experience you have and it's also split between general psychologists and clinical psychologists. That's the exact amount that you would get paid if you worked within the hospital system. However, if you're working in private practice, generally you get a little bit more than that if you're working like an equivalent full-time load. What usually happens is you actually register as a private contractor. I have an Australian business number and I'm like a contractor to the practice. My clinic director kind of hires me and she pays me a cut of the session fees. Typically people charge between like $160 to $250 per session based on their level of experience, what area they work in, maybe which location they work in, and they might take a cut between like 40 to 70-ish percent, and so it's split between the clinic director and the psychologist. The percentage of the cut depends on like how much administration support they are giving you. So are they getting everyone to do all the calls or do you have to do it yourself? Um, 
how many days you get the room, are they providing you with supervision as well, do they provide you with training and send you to seminars for free. So that kind of stuff all gets worked out between the clinic director and the psychologist. In a typical day, I might see between five to seven clients as well. And so feel free to kind of do a little bit of maths. I'm so sorry, I wish I could tell you exactly what it is, but it is written in my contract, so I can't disclose the exact amount. And I think the reason for that is because everyone has their own amounts based on their specific level of need and also what the clinic is providing them with as well. For instance, because I get a lot of supervision, I get one hour of supervision every week with the clinic director, I might be getting a bit of a lower cut than someone else who doesn't require any supervision and who's been working for I also just wanted to note that if you're working within the hospital system, you usually get paid on a salary so just like if you were working a retail job how they give you a particular um, check like every two weeks that's the same amount if you're a private contractor you get paid according to how many patients you see so you are kind of incentivized to see more clients you got to really be careful with the private practice you enroll in when I was first looking for jobs I did enroll Sorry, I did interview with quite a few and some were saying like you need to see at least seven to eight clients, otherwise you're not worth me hiring you. However, my clinic director was so lovely and she said, I know you're just starting off, I don't want you to burn out, so it's really up to you how many you see. And I found that that gradual transition between seeing like five people to start and now sometimes I can see up to seven, that has been really good. Um, another question I got, I think the first person to bring this up was someone called Sam, was can you work with kids and adults, like who can you work with? The great thing is within your master's training you get trained across the lifespan, so we do, we have to have child placements and we have to have adult placements and within that it basically means that we're trained across the lifespan and so you can go into any area you like after graduation. In terms of specialities, within clinical psychology you can really do anything that you want to. And so usually it's just based on where you find your job. I really like working with child and family as well as young people. However, I often see like pain clinics, older person, um, working in cancer and oncology. And those are all areas that I could also go into if I was interested. So the great thing is about psychology, you were trained for kind of anything and then you're the one who gets to choose where you'd like to work in and you're not locked in. So even though I'm working at a child practice right now, it doesn't prevent me from going for jobs where it's fully adult work if I'd like to as well. So it's quite simple. If you find a different area of interest, you can just find a new job in that particular area and you learn pretty quickly on the job as well. Another big question was, can you study psychology while you're working? Um, and I think the first person who brought this up was someone named Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. So in undergrad, I was working kind of pretty much my whole uni career. There's plenty of time for it because psychology, there's not a lot of in-person classes. You have to go to certain tutorials and attend lectures, but I think there were like two full days where I didn't really have anything scheduled. So I worked part-time at the uni doing some student life stuff and leading a volunteering team. I also worked in a news agency and retail and so there was plenty of time in my undergrad. When I got to masters however the first half year is just coursework and so during that time I was able to work in with Batir as a facilitator. However once you get into placements and you're moving between like a hospital and you're moving between the university psychology clinic it did get really hectic. I'd say a sustainable amount of part-time work is about the equivalent of one day a week extra work. There were plenty of people who had research jobs and did the four days of studying and the one day of extra work to earn some money, but I probably wouldn't say that you could hold up a full like part-time job or and definitely not a full-time job unless you had lots of experience juggling things like that in the past and you kind of know that you don't have too much time to socialize and to relax. However, I also know that some unis offer part-time master's program. I know for some people it's just impossible to take two years and only work one day a week financially. And so for those people, I think it's a really good idea to maybe go part-time instead of studying it full-time. And the last question is about the master's versus PhD and the combined master's PhD. So basically, in Australia, if you want to become a clinical psychologist, you have to do a master's program. A couple of people have told me that in the US it's different, you have to do a PhD. And so 
in Australia, PhD is something that you can do alongside your master's. It'll extend your degree by two years. However, it's not necessary. And so people who have a PhD actually can't become psychologists, uh, but people who just do master's can become a psychologist. If you do a combined, it it's nice because you get the doctor title in front of your name, but also you kind of become a specialist. I think most people who enrolled in the masters were just doing masters alone. Out of our cohort of, I think it was 18 people at UCID, I think maybe four of them were doing combined masters and PhD. We also had um, people who tried to pick up the PhD halfway through the program, and so they did one year of masters, and in their second year they actually picked up the PhD. So that's also an option. However, please ask your uni, because I know not every uni does it that way. And the last question, which I get asked very often, was why did I become a psychologist? How did I find myself taking this path? And I kind of like, what drew me to it? The funny thing is, this answer kind of changes a bit now that I'm a psychologist and I look back and I have kind of connected the dots but what originally drew me to psychology was I loved science it was my favorite subject at high school in fact it was physics specifically I actually thought about doing something in astrophysics but then we had a careers class in high school and gosh a bit embarrassed to admit this but we did the Maya Briggs test which by the way is not at all indicative of what you need to be doing careers wise um, but I connected a lot with it and I got INFJ as my little indicator and under that one some of the suggested career pathways were like librarian but also psychologist and therapist and so I think that's kind of what made me it kind of entered my head for the first time and I thought oh it's sciencey but it's also not like just science where I'm stuck in a lab and I'd done a lot of like clubs and volunteering in high school and I loved having that person-to-person -person interaction. In terms of kind of like more personal reasons, I think growing up in an Asian household I didn't talk a lot about emotions or feelings and so it was just interesting. I was like this stuff is fascinating, don't really know a lot about it, would love to learn more and I think a lot of people are drawn to psychology because they're interested in learning those principles or applying those principles to themselves and so for someone who didn't really use a lot of emotional language or wasn't very in tune with how I was feeling um, like I had a really just like go 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 kind of attitude I think the idea of psychology was really lovely and interesting and so I was drawn to psychology just really because I was interested in it and to be honest I didn't know about the job prospects of it at that time, this was like six, seven years ago, psychology wasn't quite as popular as it is today. It's a really strong value of mine that I want to do things that I am passionate about with my life. And so the fact that I could help people, it was really interesting. And that it was a stable career and I knew that there were jobs out there for psychologists was something that was really motivating for me. So I kind of, as soon as I locked in and I was like, I want to do it, I didn't really stray much from it after that. Thinking back now and like kind of connecting the dots, I think growing up as a Buddhist and going to temple and learning mindfulness and meditation and like acceptance, there were so many little kind of threads in my life and sitting down with my parents and talking about happiness and where does that come from and those kinds of conversations in my particular household, I think, really contributed to this path as well. Um, and my parents as well, I think, growing up, we always went out and volunteered at the temple or volunteered with older people in our community. So I think growing up, perhaps I had those values just kind of by going along with my parents and doing volunteering events on the weekends. They kind of just became part of who I was. And so... Perhaps I had attached part of my identity and my ego to being someone who went out and did stuff that was helpful and I really enjoyed it, it was really fun. So I think that kind of retrospectively is one of the reasons that I also studied psychology. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions and you'd like me to do another Q&A video like this where I just go through all the comments and uh, talk about them all in one video feel free to let me know just comment down below leave me a like it really helps support my channel especially now that I'm starting out and I hope everyone has a super merry Christmas thanks so much bye guys